Actually, I'm on there now, but for some reason it's showing up as R. I don't know why. My, my logo. Councilor Ledeen, can you hear us okay? I can hear you fine, Mayor. I'm pulling into the parking lot right now. We'll wait for you.
Good evening, counselors. It is 6.32 p.m. I will call the Tuesday, January 3rd meeting of the Superior 2023 Superior Common Council to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Will the clerk please call the roll? Councilor Ladeen. Here. Councilor Van Sickle. Here. Councilor Sweeney. Here. Councilor Fennessy. Here. Councilor Elm. Here. Councilor Ludwig. Here. Councilor Herrick. Here. Councilor Johnson. Here. Councilor Grasky. Here. We have a quorum. Item 3.1. Oh, do we have John on the line yet? John Winter. Yes, I'm. I, okay, item three point one. Yeah, I'm. I, I'm here. Perfect. Uh, Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. Um, the first item on the agenda is uh, a presentation by Business Manager John Winter uh, regarding the Douglas County Historical Society. Mr. Winter. Yeah, I, I'm sorry I can't uh, be there with you in person due to the weather. I, I decided uh, it was best I get home as quickly as possible. I live in a um, down Highway 13, um, but made it here safely. Um, so I'll, I'll just briefly go through uh, um, the PowerPoint that I, I or, or at least uh, by, by voice, uh, the PowerPoint that I put together. Uh, just some highlights from uh, 2022 and then what we have upcoming in 2023. Uh, this past year, uh, we partnered with a new uh, uh, theater partner, uh, Northern Spotlight Theater. They um, put, put youth uh, um, through the, uh, around the Twin Ports um, in the spotlight. Um, most of the uh, um, students in the theater group are uh, homeschool children from all around the Twin Ports. We had our first production in November. Uh, You're a good man, Charlie Brown. It was very successful. Two of our three nights were were sold out nights. The other night was close to sold out. Uh, our next production um, is going to be in the first two weeks of March, um, and it's going to be the Butler did it. This year is going to be actually family theater, so it's going to be adult and older youth uh, involved in the production. Little twist on this version is instead of it in London, it's going to be set in Superior. Uh, the script allowed us to change the setting, so we're going to uh, add a little bit of local history to the to the script, uh, getting back to our history theater roots. Um, coming in 2023, and this is really a project we started out in 2022, is to ha produce a new Ojibwe exhibit. Uh, our first step uh, in doing this was to work with a um, in student intern uh, from UWS, a First Nation Studies intern, um, and it was really just to uh, uh, do an inventory of books and documents uh, that uh, uh, pertain to um, the, the Ojibwe's and, and to, to know what resources we had available. Um, the start of the exhibit will, or the the exhibit will include the region of uh, La Pointe to Fond du Lac and then south to Gordon. And we've decided that the, the, our starting point will use the era of 1800 to 1899. Uh, this was prior to the, the uh, treaties and then the years past uh, the treaties. But that's only a starting point. Um, obviously, we want to expand that out uh, uh, further in, in the in the future, uh, we we did engage with the Fond du Lac band. Uh, we want to use them for guidance. Um, uh, we had a group visit us. Um, they also reviewed our, uh, items in our archives, uh, books and documents. Uh, they found some of them very very interesting. What we've done now is we've scanned those, and we're going to be giving uh, digital copies of of that archive uh, to the Fond du Lac band. So that they will have um, our, our a copy of our archives uh, for their use, and then our next step uh, that we're going to be taking is to review our collection and determine what what um, is in our.
collection of Ojibwe origin and um, to make sure we document that correctly. And we hope to also engage the Fond du Lac Band in that process. Um, our, we've uh, created some internship uh, programs with both UMD and UWS. Uh, we currently have one UMD intern. We had one past intern from 2021-2022. Uh, we'll be working with another UWS intern um, in this coming spring. Uh, intern projects uh, have included uh, organizing our archives and archive room collection, uh, including the session information, uh, photographing our, our collection, um, and, and then the location of every item in our collection on, on what shelf uh, and what box it's in. Um, another intern projects, of course, are exhibits. Um, events from the 2022, um, one event we had was Fashion Through the Ages show. Um, went very well. Um, we had Photography History Month, uh, thanks to a TDF grant um, for helping get the publicity out on that. Uh, maybe we didn't get quite the, the response we were hoping for, but it was a, a something new and, a, and I think a step in the right direction and, and brought in some people from all over, you know, uh, the Twin Cities area and all over the uh, area, upper area of Wisconsin. Um, we had uh, a couple of Zoom uh, guest speakers. One was Michael Fox from the Museum of the Rockies, uh, talking about David F. Berry, uh, frontier photographer. Uh, Michael Fox is probably the the foremost expert on on, on David F. Berry, um, and it was really a, a great to uh, challenge for us to see how we can uh, bring in guest speakers from all over the United States. Um, on May 21st, we also had a, a Zoom guest speaker, Jean Bubbly, who is the niece of Esther Bubbly, who Esther grew up here in Superior uh, and became a photojournalist and um, and that and really a worldwide traveler. Um, that that also went real well. Um, another uh, Zoom uh, guest speaker we had this past year was Don Yorsky. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Tony Jaworski, a, a local artist. Uh, Don Jaworski is his nephew. Uh, Don's uh, topic was the art career, commercial art career of his father, uh, Alex Jaworski. And then he also talked about his uncles, uh, Tony and Nicholas, who were also uh, artists. Um, in October, we had a guest speaker, Tommy Alicia. Uh, this is the author of the book uh, Beauty Beauty at Short. Um, Dave Bancroft. It's on Dave Bancroft, um, the most unlikely of Hall of Famers. Uh, Dave grew up in Iowa, but then came to Superior to play minor league baseball in 1909. Uh, went on to a 16-year career in the major leagues and was inducted into Baseball Hall of Fame. And the book is is um, a fascinating story. The book is doing very well on Amazon. Um, and uh, we're very lucky to have Tom come up and, and speak in person. Uh, two traveling exhibits we had. Uh, one was on e Esther Bubbly. We had that in May, from May 1st to actually July 16th. Um, Esther Bubbly photography exhibit. Uh, the exhibit was World War II Jewish defense workers in Washington, D.C. It was from her work in, uh, in, in that period. Um, um, and then the other traveling exhibit we had was uh, ju start July 19th and went through October 8th, and that was Dave Bancroft exhibit uh, provided by Tom Alicia, uh, the author, the author of Beauty at Short. Uh, fundraising events uh, we're looking forward to in 2023: uh, Murder Mystery Dinner. Uh, we'll do our Living History Walk out of Greenwood Cemetery. Uh, we'll, as I discussed, we'll do uh, more theater events. Uh, we've done craft fairs, and we'll continue to do those. We may not make much money on the craft fairs, but they do bring in uh, people to our building that we often hear time and time again. Wow, I've never been in this building. Didn't know you were here. Uh, this past uh, fall, we had a total of just over 400 people attend our three craft fairs. Um, so it definitely is bringing people in our doors. Um, 
other fundraising events we have, we've talked about are our historical tours of Tower Avenue, Central Park, East End, and bringing back our pub crawl um, as potential fundraising events for 2023. Uh, other events we have are educational events. In 2023, we, in the fall, we'll, we uh, hope to bring back our History Sunday programming. It'll be uh, six Sundays um, where we have various uh, guest speakers um, on, on a number of topics uh, come in. Um, we'll have hopefully new exhibit openings. Hopefully we'll be able to open our, our new Ojibwe exhibit um, in the later part of uh, 2023, if not early 2024. Um, Wisconsin Historical Society, as some of you may know, uh, has, is uh, building a new museum. Um, but they're going to provide uh, opportunities for traveling exhibits. So we're going to look at those opportunities and hopefully bring in some of their traveling exhibits. Um, Zoom uh, programs, we hope to uh, continue with some of those also from the Wisconsin Historical Society and other guest speakers. And, and host th this uh, March, we're going to host the uh, Douglas County uh, Genealogy Club uh, lock-in. In the past, it's been at the library. Uh, we'll change there with scheduling, and uh, we're going to be hosting that this year for them on, on March 31st. Um, that's all I have to report. Um, I don't know if there's any questions. Uh, if you don't ask them uh, tonight, uh, please reach out to me. Um, call me at the, the museum or send me an email at dchs. Org. Um, like to have all you come and visit and uh, take you on a tour of not only our, our exhibits but also um, show our our collection area and our archive area and some of the great work we're doing down there. Thank you. Uh, questions or comments from the council? Uh, Councilor Van Sickle. Um, I just wanted to thank Mr. Winter for coming and um, for prioritizing his safety and getting home safely. Um, this is exactly what we were looking for, you know, just um, a brief review of some of the activities and programming, which um, by the sounds of it is very ambitious. And um, this was really informative, it was interesting. And, you know, we can comb through P&Ls all day, but um, this really just helps us and the community understand more about what um, local organizations are up to. So thank you, um, thank you for coming tonight. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you for those kind words. Any further questions or comments? If not, uh, thank you, Mr. Winter. Good evening. Thank you. Yep, have a, have a good evening and safe travels home, everyone. Thank you. Item 4.1 is the approval of minutes from the September 20th regular council meeting. Motion. Motion is by Councillor Herrick, the second by Councillor Elm. Is there discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. Motion carries. Item 6.1 is a report from Mayor Payne. Uh, well, welcome back, Councillors. It, it feels like it's been a long time. It's the usual time for us, but uh, m most of the city staff or many of us have uh, been out of the building for several days over the holidays. Uh, this, the, the coming months are, uh, for me, something of a policy building time. And so I told you at the last meeting that I'll be going to Madison tomorrow as they begin their session. Uh, this is sort of the city's first uh, uh, trip to establish our priorities to learn about what uh, the rest of the legislature uh, and the governor's priorities are for the coming year and, and to try and get our foot in the door as early as possible. Again, it's separate from Superior Days, uh, but I've got a small agenda. It will be the first of, I assume, several trips in the spring to Madison. Uh, then in March, I intend to go back to Washington, D.C. I haven't been in a few years, so I'm going to attend uh, the National League of Cities Congressional Conference. That's where the NLC, we're a member of the NLC by virtue of our membership in the League of Wisconsin Municipalities. Uh, and so that's our national representatives or association. And uh, so we'll be talking about all things cities at the national level, but I'm trying to schedule a couple of other meetings that might be especially relevant for Superior as well. Uh, so if you have issues of national importance, particularly what we would call agency issues, so things uh, uh, involving federal oversight or rulemaking uh, or, or just 
things where the federal government has jurisdiction in Superior, Northern, uh, Northern Wisconsin, uh, let me know. Uh, happy to put that on my agenda or invite you along. It should be a, a pretty fun and exciting trip. Otherwise, most of my conference work uh, tends to happen in the spring where I do a lot of my learning. Uh, I think I've mentioned to most of you before, I always attend the Congress of New Urbanism. I try to take new folks with me every year. A couple of counselors have joined me on that. So if you have gone, sorry, you're not invited unless the, the council approves that budget. But if you want to come on mine, uh, on my budget, let me know. And especially if you've never gone, this year will be Charlotte, North Carolina. So uh, that's the only report I have. We're just getting back to work. Item 7.1 is the business of the Human Resources Committee from a regular meeting held December 19th and a special meeting held December 22nd. Is there a report from the chair? Um, besides um, the um, action items on this evening's agenda, um, our only other item um, was that we approved um, the request to fill two mechanic positions and subsequent vacancies if filled in-house. And the vacancies um, will be due to retirement. Um, so uh, um, do we wanna do these um, one at a time as far as the recommendations? Sure. Okay, so, okay. So, so clerk, if you could please read those, sure. sir. Thank you. The first recommendation is to approve updates to the non-union salary and benefits policy handbook to eliminate obsolete public works control point language and update working form and job description and pay rates effective on January 1st. I'll make the motion to approve. Motion is by Council Ludwig, second by Council Fennessy. Is there discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. Motion carries. The second recommendation, recommendation is to approve flexible work policy number 01.16, which will eliminate the existing telecommuting policy. Motion to approve. Motions by Councilor Ludwig, second by Councilor Ledeen. Is there discussion? Hearing, Councilor Ludwig, the light is still on. Oh, I'm sorry. Hearing no other discussion, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed say no. Motion carries. The recommendation number three is to approve extending the COVID-19 related administration leave policy through January 31st, 2023. Motions by Council Ludwig, second by Council Sweeney. Is there discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed say no. Motion carries. Item or recommendation number four is to approve the wage increase adjustment of 5% for all non union employees effective on January 1st, 2023. Motions by Councillor Fennessy, second by Councillor Ludwig. Uh, discussion? Councillor Fennessy. Um, I'll be abstaining on this item. Thank you. Mm, the minute will reflect your abstention. Is there further? Councillor Johnson. Uh, thank you. Just to, you know, I saw in the, in the agenda packet here in your notes, uh, and obviously I'm not asking you to talk about anything in the closed door session, but I noticed that there was some non union uh, negotiation or some union negotiations happening as well. Um, have they received an offer? Or are those still ongoing? Councilor, why don't I hold that question until we resolve this item and then I'll, I'll allow the okay. chair to answer that. Is there any further discussion on the 5% wage increase for non-union employees? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed say no. Motion carries. Uh, Councilor, could you restate your question here? Yes, uh, thank you. So just uh, seen in the, in the minutes that we, uh, from the last meeting and then you had a special meeting I believe on like the 21st or 22nd uh, there was some union negotiations and I'm not asking for any sort of closed door uh, revelations here certainly but um, just wondering where those uh, union negotiations uh, are at. Council Ludwig do you feel comfortable answering that? I just um, as far as I'm aware of they're still ongoing. Uh, were there any other questions for the chair of the Human Resources Committee? If not, we'll move on. Item 7.5 is the business of the Public Safety Committee from a meeting held December 15th. Is there a report from the chair? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Chair. Um, outside of the two action items that you see um, before you from Public Safety Committee, uh, clearing up some, some more of our uh, parking in the, within the city, uh, public safety uh, continues the discussion on strengthening the city's leash laws. Um, 
we are continuing this discussion at the next meeting and look to have something to the council in February regarding that. Uh, also had a presentation from uh, Jen Stank, the coordinated response specialist for SPD. This was a priority of the council, wanted to see how things were going. Uh, she discussed her, her day to day operations, including uh, running the Pathways to Hope program, discussed her, her role in assisting the police department and helping those in mental health or chemical dependencies crisis, um, dealing with the follow up, including uh, the, the follow up with those individuals, in, including talking about um, the resources available to them um, in, in this community, discussed um, some of the strengths, um, some of the things where, where this area needs some improvement, especially in, in the world of mental health or chemical dependency. Um, otherwise, I'm happy to answer any questions, and if not, I would um, make a motion to approve both the recommendations of the Public Safety Committee. Thank you, Councilor. We'll actually have to uh, read, read them individually. My apologies. Sure. The first recommendation is to approve Ordinance 234296, an ordinance amending City Code Chapter 112, Traffic Code, Article 3, Parking, Schedule C, No Parking on Odd Numbered Side of Street, to add Winter Street from Cypress Avenue to Hammond Avenue. Motion approved. Motion is by Councilor Levine, second by Councilor Johnson. Is there discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. Motion carries. Recommendation number two is to approve Ordinance 234297, an ordinance amending City Code Chapter 112, Traffic Code, Article 7, Schedule I, Streets Excluded from Calendar Parking to add Winter Street from Cypress Avenue to Hammond Avenue. Motion is by Councilor Levine, a second by Councilor Johnson. Is there a discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed say no. Motion carries. Item 8.1.1 is the business of the Plan Commission from a meeting held December 21st. Is there a report from the chair? Yes, uh, Councilors, the Plan Commission, you see the business that they approved in front of you. Three more small business grants. This uh, did not use up all of the money for this particular quarter, so uh, as usual, that money will roll over. Uh, it's a relatively small balance rolling over, but uh, the commission will decide how they want to spread that out in the next uh, in the next quarter as we start the new year, whether it's to take the new higher amount and divide it up or, or keep allowing it to roll over some kind of bigger project. No clue which way that's going to go. Uh, we, uh, we also approved the uh, neighborhood uh, improvement fund allocation to a uh, pilot project for landscaping called Scenery and Home. You have that uh, those details in your packet that was proposed by Councillor Van Sickle. And after the business, we had a, a fairly lengthy conversation about zoning uh, because we will be uh, undertaking an, a, a complete rewrite of our zoning code this year. Uh, it's a very substantial policy, second only to the comprehensive plan. But this one actually has more direct and regular implications, uh, we deal with the zoning code on a regular basis. So uh, the goal of rewriting it is to not have to deal with it as often on a regular basis. There will still be pretty significant administrative review as development happens, but right now almost no new development fits within the existing zoning code. So it's, it's both obsolete and if we fully enforced it, it'd be a pretty big barrier to development. There's a, a lot of opportunity, however, in a new code, and while it can seem really boring, it's actually pretty exciting economic development work. It's, it's not just the kind of economic development you're used to thinking about, like uh, large construction projects or business growth. It's really about developing every single neighborhood in the city of Superior in, in the way we want to see it develop, both preserving the character of existing neighborhoods and designing them uh, for the future. So it, it's really exciting. Uh, we've taken to calling it a little bit nerdy, but we're all having a lot of fun with it. So I'd, in, I'd invite you to join those conversations, especially as it becomes more public and we create something like a steering committee like we did with the comp plan. So feel free to forward questions about that to myself or Jason Sirk. Uh, otherwise, my recommendation is to approve all four of the recommendations of the plan commission. The motion is by Councilor Elm, second by Councilor Grasky. Discussion, Councilor Pennis. Uh, can we pull item number four for uh, discussion? Uh, yes, we'll divide item number four, uh, but I'll take items one through three first. Is there further discussion on items one through three? Hearing none, uh, these are the small business grants. Hearing none, all those in favor of approving all three small business grants, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. The motion carries. Uh, item four is, uh, is there 
objection, be holding the same motion and second from Councilor Elm and Grasky? If not, uh, Councilor Elm and Councilor Grasky also made the motion to approve item four, the landscaping program discussion. Councilor Pence. Um, I just wanna, I just wanna start off by saying that this had a lot of support at the plan commission where it, um, where it went first, actually went there uh, twice. And uh, I mean, I think it's a really uh, well thought out program. Everyone involved did a nice job putting together the, the details. The, but my support for a program like this really slows down when it's funded by property tax dollars. I'd have an easier time supporting something like this if it was grant funded as like a pilot program to try and throw some number, um, some money into some of these neighborhoods. Because I'm, I'm all for beautifying the city, but I have a really hard time finding the value in this in spending $30,000 of property tax dollars to landscape six private lots. And even if I could see the value in it, I don't even believe it's the city's responsibility to put mulch and flowers on private property and then in years two and three do ongoing trimming and um, weeding. Um, I, I think if, if we were to do some sort of beautification you know, efforts for um, you know, residents in hardship that this is kind of you know, geared towards, I think the money would be much better spent helping residents fix up the essentials like siding, windows, um, porches, stairs, et cetera. Um, I, I just have a really hard time supporting this program when it's $30,000 of taxpayer money to beautify only six private lots on owner-occupied homes. Council Grasky. Uh, just to clarify, this money, we as a council voted on putting it into a neighborhood improvement fund. Yes, the neighborhood improvement fund, it's, it's a rolling fund within the capital improvement program. Technically, it's grant funded for the next five years. All of that money is funded by ARPA for the next two years. In the past, it's always been just a regular CIP allocation, though. Okay, so it, we as a council voted on that money as it in to go into the neighborhood. Yes, that's fund. part of the adopted okay. CIP plan. Okay. Further discussion? Uh, Councilor Queen. So when we take this money from the purpose that it was intended, does that mean that that those requests are for, for improving whatever are null and void? We don't have any? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't understand your question. Request from the existing neighborhood improvement right, fund? Right, exactly. No, the neighborhood improvement fund is a rolling, uh, right. uh, it's not an enterprise fund, but it's, it's a rolling fund and it's got some annualized expenses. Uh, it, its largest expense used to be the demolition of homes and neighborhoods, right. but we largely don't do that anymore. So there's a couple of uh, basic property improvement things that we do with it. Uh, so we, uh, I think we mow city owned lots. If we have to abate private property, like go onto somebody's property, mow the lawn or clear the sidewalks, we'll take money out of that. We usually try to recoup that money. And then there are some planning staff that uh, draw, or and public works staff that uh, draw some salary out of it. Uh, but the, the point I made to the plan commission is it's it runs a surplus every year. We Our ongoing expenses are not enough to draw down that fund, so it's been growing. Okay, we need a further explanation. Where does the money come from if, if a home is uh, abandoned, needs to be we determined that it, we can't save the, the building, the home? The neighborhood improvement fund. Right. And so there are no existing homes in that category right now? Not that I know of. No. No. The, well, the, the planning director shook his head emphatically that no, there are no, none outstanding. And part of the reason for that, Counselor, is because when when we issue a raise and repair on a home, it almost always goes into the vacant home, vacant house recycling program, right. which you, you actually see later on this agenda. And so we offer it for very little money, sometimes no money at all. And it's been not 100% successful, but very close to it. So most of those properties are taken by developers that will rehab them. And so that's why we, it, that program was never meant to permanently stop demolitions. There will still be demolitions. They've just become so rare that the fund is now, it has a pretty healthy balance. What is the difference between a house that must be uh, torn down, if you would, versus um, it, it hasn't reached that category? I, I can think of in my district, uh, right off the top of my head, four or five homes that are in that category that have 
laid vacant for three or four years, five years perhaps. They're in Syria. I, I don't know if they can be saved or not, but from what I understand, it would be very difficult to save them. So w if we're to do something with those, where does, does that money come out of that? It doesn't come out of this fund then. If it, if a house must be here, demolished? Right, right. Yes, if a house must be demolished, it does, we pay for that from the, any expenses the city incurs, most of which are in kind. So, right. uh, but any expenses we actually incur, we, we charge to the Neighborhood Improvement Fund. Uh, the, the answer to your question, though, about w what the line is, that's a market-driven decision. So I would argue there's no such thing as a house that can't be saved. It doesn't matter how much money you're willing to put into it. Uh, I think I agree with that. But, <laughs> yeah, so, right. uh, but so what we do is we let the market decide. We say if we will charge you nothing for it, is somebody willing to put the money in to save it? And so far in almost every single case, the answer has been yes. When you say it's in kind, that means it's incurred within the city expense, right? Yes. Not, okay. From yeah, not being okay. technical, but it's not an in kind. Per se. Yeah, in, it is incurred within the city, but right. say uh, any any work performed by the public works right. department, they don't back bill that to the neighborhood improvement no. funds. I, I understand. Okay, thank you, Councilor Harry. Yeah, I was just going to question, and Jason, maybe you can uh, let me know if this. I heard that they're going to raise a house on the twenty third in Oaks. There's a house that's been abandoned there. I thought I heard they were going to. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Thanks. Councilor Johnson. Um, yeah, I think, you know, what I'm hearing a lot of support for this, and it makes sense. I think the beautification of our city overall makes a lot of sense. I think we've probably all heard some form of that uh, uh, complaint over the years, and so this makes sense overall. Um, I do have a couple of questions that I was hoping to get answered. Um, are we tracking like, um, you know, I'm just looking at the program overview and what the goals are um, and, and looking at continuing this program if this is kind of a pilot program. What would we look at as a measure for um, maybe success isn't the right word, but what would we use as an overall measure for continuing this program in the future uh, to make sure that we're using these funds appropriately. Uh, I'll, Councilor Van Sickle wrote the uh, proposal, <coughs> so I'll allow her to uh, answer afterwards, but this is the Planning Commission's recommendation now. So the uh, ultimately, the measurement of success is determined by the council at the time when it determines whether to extend the program. So you will look at, because there may be some clear definable markers like did property tax value increase uh, or, or did the home values increase in that neighborhood? Uh, were folks able to maintain the property beyond the investment period? Uh, the uh, Did it inspire, this will be harder to track, but did it inspire other similar work in the neighborhood? Uh, and then you can evaluate other things that, that aren't as measurable. Did people just like it? Does the neighborhood look better? Are you getting compliments? Does it seem worthwhile? So uh, it, it's really similar to the small business grant program where there's no clear outcomes defined. It's, an, it's a direct investment in private property uh, to make it better and to improve the overall community. Only the council can decide if we've met that goal. Uh, Councilor Van Sickle. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to thank um, the planning staff and the counselors um, and especially the plan commission, because um, if you've ever passed a policy through the plan commission, you know that there is um, really strong collaboration in programming, and um, they take their policy very seriously. So when you go to plan commission, you have to be very prepared and be willing to shift so at the first iteration of this program, I drew it most closely from the adopted um, 2040 comprehensive plan that um, is largely the charge of the plan commission, which is why I went there first. And the plan commission had really good suggestions around, and just a lot of really positive feedback. Um, aesthetics is only one small benefit of the program, um, the plan commission, um, suggested working in 
you know, a lot of native grasses and pollinators that o that would also help align um, existing city goals. So a really good example of how we do this now is our backflow relief program. So that is um, similar price point, um, about $2,000 or so per house um, through private vendors and with the same goals of preventing um, harmful runoff in the environment as well as um, um, let me think here. So it's got similar costs and similar goals on private property. And you'll remember after about 20 years or so, that program was expanded finally because there are only so many houses in Superior. So the outcome was finite um, in the goal being um, to prevent um, flooding. And this is similar in the way that it would help reduce stormwater runoff, which of course helps keep the lake cleaner. Um, so aesthetics is one benefit, um, but there are real environmental benefits. Um, another similar, another similar um, way to look at it is that we already spend, um, you know, tens of thousands of dollars on landscaping through the major business corridors in Superior. So Tower and Belknap, um, we oversee, I want to say, upwards of $60,000 a year to oversee that, um, that landscaping contract. There's also a really interesting um, dichotomy here around extraction and installment. And originally, when I did the research for this program, I consulted with the league to see how other cities were spending neighborhood improvement dollars. And one of the ideas was to get a dumpster and put, you know, have neighbors want to, you know, have kind of a landfill days in their own neighborhood and it would help clean things up. And I think it's beneficial to help, you know, throw out couches and furniture, cars or whatever it is. But I also think it's equally important to invest in our neighborhoods. Now, I think there's something like a quarter million dollars in this fund. So if we're looking at the stated policy recommended by the plan commission, um, you'll see in the minutes it reads at least six homes, not just six homes. So that's an important um, detail. And the stated goal with the vendor was approximately $2,000 per house. Um, now the policy is the recommendation from the plan commission. The details of the program, of course, still have to be worked out through a contract as well. So we have some flexibility in that spending schedule, but the plan commission did request an evaluation at the end of 2024 where we could expect approximately 12 homes being done by that. So you know by that math, it's not $30,000, it's approximately 12. Um, if we're able to expand or continue the funding, um, we'll certainly talk to neighbors, we'll present before and afters, um, you know, see what went well and where, you know, I expect there will be room for growth, of course. Um, America in Bloom, um, I believe the city won an award for the plantings on the Osagi. There are gardens in the city parks. Um, so we do spend a lot of time and energy beautifying the city. And um, I'll agree with Councillor Johnson, certainly, you know, from North End to the highway, the comp plan was the, the correct structure because so many businesses and because so many residents had weighed in on what they wanted to see. And that was to have these neighborhoods specifically spruced up. Now the plan commission um, helped further form that program and we eventually opened up to the entire city being eligible with some preference criteria based on proximity. Councilor Johnson, the lights on. Do you have more questions? I do. Uh, so I guess uh, in the application process then, is that, uh, that goes right through the plan commission for each one of the homes that would be approved. Everybody's uh, on the plan commission would have a say in with how Yes, with ultimate council approval. Okay. Uh, so, oh, so we would get uh, ultimate say on the approval of those com yes. contracts then? Okay. Uh, so then 
you know, kind of just thinking if like $2,000 for a home that is a smaller lot versus $2,000 for one that's a bigger lot, we could really make a big difference in a maybe smaller lot versus a larger one. And so that was maybe one of the questions I had or concerns of just uh, the specific dollar amount. Is it exactly $2,000 or are we just getting like the professionals to tell us, hey, we think we can make, we can do this uh, for this lot and this for that lot, those types of things. I, I only see three. So, so I want to keep us to the actual proposal recommended by the plan commission. And there's three hard numbers, $30,000, uh, three years, uh, and uh, at least six homes. So uh, beyond that, the planning department has some flexibility in what they recommend. Uh, then the plan commission of, and the council have ultimate full discretion. But we would not be able to recommend outside. So for example, we'd not be able to recommend more money than that, nor an, another year into say 26 or 27 without further uh, adoption of the program. Uh, but, but I, I think it's designed to gear it towards smaller and more impactful properties. Fair enough. All right. I don't know if that answers my question, but I'll, I'll move on. Um, Can I take a stab? Yeah. So working with the vendor, um, originally we, we estimated that um, a graduated approach um, might help build some grassroots marketing. Um, the plan commission um, thought that um, there was maybe a better way, so we ended up scrapping that and just making it the same amount across the homes. So uh, we know that $2,000 is enough to make an impact both environmentally and aesthetically. Um, and we will ultimately work out square footage um, and, and the, the, the planning staff w will work through those applications and we will um, try to make the, the best choices based on the applications that we get. So going back to the numbers which you mentioned, Mr. Mayor, the 12,000 or just in the pilot proposal, it's thirty thousand dollars. But if you break it down, it's twelve thousand uh, for two years, and then twelve thousand for the next two after that, right? Yeah, twelve thousand, three thousand. So twelve thousand for the initial cohort, twenty-three. That group will then share three thousand among them for maintenance the next year. That same year, we will add a new cohort, which will be eligible for a pot of twelve thousand which will then the next year be eligible for another $3,000. And what does that uh, upkeep or $3,000 pay for? What does that What does that do? What do they? Uh, maintenance of the existing landscaping and planting. So if the, uh, uh, the initial improvements are a larger investment, obviously like putting plants in, make, uh, uh, making major alterations, the upkeep is the smallest amount possible to keep it looking basically the same as when it was created. So is there any onus on the homeowner to show that they've, uh, I mean, we could have some a homeowner that comes in and says, yeah, come fix my property and then doesn't do anything with it. And then they would have, uh, we would have to spend a lot more money to upkeep that property versus another one. So is there any discussion that's been had about that upkeep after the fact and maybe, maybe some onus on the homeowners to help, uh, because $3,000 isn't a whole lot to split amongst all those to, for upkeep. So how are we making sure that the, the funds are being uh, well maintained? Council Van Cook, you're going to start talking about that one. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the plan commission asked um, a couple of times about maintenance and how are we going to hold um, uh, homeowners accountable. And I, um, I just want us to exercise the authority in which we're given in the most positive way. Um, sometimes we hear that, you know, that we can't build things because it'll get burned down or vandalized. And these folks will be applying to be in the program. They will submit a narrative and photos and why they're the best fit. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know of any program that we have where we go back and check to make sure that a business is keeping their brand new tap lines clean or that they're not abusing the, the private cameras that we bought through the small business grant or that the refrigerators are being maintained. Um, so I just want us to treat uh, the residents with you know, as much trust and respect as possible. They are the funders that make everything possible. 
Um, but maintenance was an important point, and I agree. Um, so this this has um, a multi-year effect, and um, you know I just think we have to have a little faith if somebody has applied for this program that they really want to be involved. Um, I've told the story a couple of times where. Um, you know, when I was at the senior center, people would call who have just kind of lost not so much the financial ability, but the physical ability to restart or maintain their gardens, um, just looking for some support. So um, I think it's a very small investment that can go a really long way. The uh, maintenance budget, along with the initial cohort budget, will also require plan commission approval. So the way it's distributed amongst the original cohort, plan commission will present a recommended plan to the plan commission, uh, which again would require council adoption. But they could take the money and and then use it to beautify their house or sell it. Then they would have no control over the next owner that comes in. It conceivably, so this is a this is for a property. But uh, to Councillor Van Sickle's point, yes, we. Uh, that there's no difference between that and the small business grant program. Ev yeah. All three of the right. businesses would just get granted to do that. Yeah, okay. Um, I've got a couple more thoughts, but uh, I'll let this other folks speak. Thank you. Councillor Sweeney. Uh, I realize this, what I'm gonna comment on is not what we're voting for, but um, it has to do with neighborhoods. In a neighborhood, if there's uh, I'll make up this scenario, but it's, uh, it's I've incurred it twice now. Uh, senior citizen has a backup sewer. They can't afford to, to pay for it. The city doesn't pay for it. Um, it's a need for the neighborhood. It's a need for this person to stay in their home. They simply can't afford it. It has to be fixed somewhere. But I, I, from reading this through and now what the discussion is, I understand that this would not cover something like that. But I think that is a far higher priority than, um, and I'm not, I'm not arguing with the beauty and the beast here, okay? But the beast comes before beauty, okay? And the beast would be to fix someone's, they can't afford it, so they can maintain, um, so they can stay in their home. I know this isn't uh, that discussion, uh, and we're not voting on that, but I just thought uh, I'd like to bring that up, perhaps even think some of, of developing a fund uh, that way, because uh, I if, the wa if the sewer backs up in their property, they're responsible, <coughs> and I get that. But some people, senior citizens especially, have just no way if a house is worth X, it's going to cost them X minus 90% of the value of it, but, and I understand that it probably isn't a good investment, but th there are some real needs there for people who have a, it's tragic that what happens to them if the sewer backs up, they simply have no m possible means of paying for it. So, but this would not be included and I get that, but I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm planting a seed if you would. You yeah, I, I, uh, I get what you're throwing down. Councilor Van Sickle, just a moment. The, uh, comes to me, the Planning Commission did discuss that. The, uh, I, I pointed out we, well, the City of Superior doesn't have that program. It does exist, uh, Northwest Regional Planning. They actually run it for the rural area, and One Roof Housing runs almost the exact program you describe as a zero interest, zero payment loan uh, to cover emergencies. The very <laughs> specific example you described is is one of the in original inspirations for this program that the backflow relief valve program where people's basements were actually backing up and flooding and we created a program to just pay for the repairs. But I think that is different. That's an investment in that person's investment. The point of this, at least when I voted for it at the Planning Commission was because it was uh, public facing and it was an investment in the neighborhood itself. So in other words, whether that person's living there uh, or they move or they pass away, uh, if that's in my neighborhood, I still get to walk by a house that's a little bit nicer. My neighborhood's improved a little bit. That was kind of the philosophy behind some of the similar programs we created as well. I, I shouldn't be speaking too much to my own, but I, I was a voting member of the Planning Commission for this. Uh, further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. The motion, in the opinion of the chair, the motion carries. Item 8.2.1 is the business of the Mayor's Commission on Communities of Color from a meeting held December 12th. Is there a report from any of the members? Okay. 
Item 10.1, I am recommending approval of miscellaneous licenses. Motions by Councillor Herrick, second by Councillor Ludwig. Is there discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. Motion carries. Item 10.2, I'm recommending approval of a temporary Class B beer license for the Douglas County Historical Society for the Christmas Musicale, which will be held on January 5th, 2023. Motions by Councillor Fennessy, second by Councillor Elm. Is there discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Those opposed say no. Motion carries. Item 10.3, I am recommending approval of a temporary Class B beer license for Performing Arts Student Scholarship Foundation for the Lake Superior Ice Festival, which will be held on January 27th and 28th of 2023. Motions by Councilor Grasky, second by Councilor Elm. Is there discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed say no. Motion carries. Item 10.4, Housing Coordinator and Planner Screenus recommends approving the, the sale of a superior vacant to Valley property located at 1525 Clough Avenue in the amount of $2,500 to Clifton Holiday, who anticipates the rehabilitation to be completed 18 months after the closing date. Mm -hmm. Motions by Councilor Fennessy, second by Councilor Elm. Is there discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed say no. Motion carries. Councillors, the only other thing I have, I, I meant to mention this in my report, the, uh, uh, at, in a meeting in, a, in just a couple of weeks, I'm going to invite the assessor to a committee of the whole where we discuss the revalue that will be taking place in 2023. By about the end of the year, we intend to have completely revalued all of the uh, uh, property in the city of Superior. Obviously, that's going to be a, a very significant change and source of anxiety for a lot of your constituents. Uh, we just kind of nominally, we'll most likely do this a few times this year, but for that first meeting, we nominally picked uh, right after the uh, spring primary. So that will be in February. Uh, it's looking like we will, ha it looks like we will have a primary in the third district council race. So uh, we thought we'd narrow that down and invite those counselors as well, but I'll communicate with the leadership about that. So please start thinking about the revalue, ask questions about it, learn about it. I, I hope for that to be a thoughtful and intelligent discussion and debate. If there is no further business, then Councilor Sweeney. I would just, um, I realize this is a little business, but I, I, I'd like to give some kudos to Public Works during the holiday for the snow removal. Uh, they had some tough times there, and uh, I think they just did an excellent job, so. Thank you, Councilor. We'll, we'll forward that along. I know they, they very much appreciate hearing that. Councilor Grafke. I also just wanted to mention that um, the Blotnick Bridge project um, public comment is due by this Friday. So I just wanted to mention that too. If any of your constituents have questions, I know that North End has been getting the word out, but just wanted to mention that on the floor. So thanks. Thank you. Any further announcements? If not, we have no more business and are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>